through this pandemic with their interviews and contact tracing and all of that good stuff that we've been hearing about and reading about we are able to have somebody who's actually in the middle of it doing it um, with us tonight so if you have any questions please go ahead and put those in the group chat area and we will get to those when we're done and then after this we'll have Keith Risky and I don't know if we have any other speakers on I think we might by the looks of things in the participant list so we will get started I'll turn it over to Greta and she's going to talk to you a little bit about what she does all right good evening everybody um first I want to thank you for all letting me come to visit with you tonight and then also just all the work that you guys do um, every day and especially during uncertain times like this where you are responding to um, and being the first responders um, in not knowing maybe what you're walking into. So if there is ever any questions, you know, in the future, feel free to give me a call. I'd be happy to visit with you or connect you with the um, right person. So again, I thank you for letting me join you at this meeting tonight. So I will first go um, start off by just kind of explaining what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I am a disease intervention specialist for the state of South Dakota um, Department of Health with the Office of Disease Prevention Services. What that is, is basically we work with all the reportable diseases in South Dakota. So anything that would probably be infectious to other individuals that would be transmitted from person to person. Um, we also do um, some epi-link um, diseases, which would be from your, you know, person to animal um, or animal to person, um, along with foodborne outbreaks. So people that go to an event or eat something, we work all those investigations to try to figure out what made them sick and try to get it off of the market or the shelves so we can um, prevent anybody else from getting sick from that, um, that source. So basically what we do is we, if somebody comes back positive, we, and that is reported from labs, doctors, um, our hospitals, and we also take, um, reports from just citizens that are out there that maybe went out to eat and got sick after um, coming home. So what we do is once we receive a positive reportable disease, we contact that person to identify what symptoms they had, um, what they were doing during an um, incubation period that maybe um, was a source of infection. Um, once we identify that we you know can put it to um, other individuals that would be working that with like public health um, that does our food services our health care licensure and certification um, and they kind of look at it a little deeper so and then all the information we gather also goes to cdc um, on the information that we obtain through our investigation so um, for an example, for some of our investigations that are very similar to COVID-19 would be our vaccine preventable diseases. So we basically look at, you know, where have you been? What have you been doing? Who have you been around? How far have you been with that person? And then we're able to determine who has maybe been um, potentially infected or maybe who started the um, illness that was maybe the source of spread. And then we also contact all of those individuals um, to provide recommendations and guidelines. And that would be for exclusions, vaccinations, treatment, um, that would be necessary to stop that spread. So kind of going on to the COVID-19 um, that everybody is kind of on alert right now would be we are the, I am the front lines of the investigation. So when somebody tests positive through any of our testing sites, um, that report comes directly to me. So I will call the patient, I will interview them. When did they get sick? What symptoms are they experiencing? Um, and where were they at? So what we look at is the date they get sick. 
Um, we look at 48 hours prior to that. And we look at where were they? Where, were they at work? Were they at home? Who were, you know, were they at a baseball game? Um, we wanna look at how many individuals they were with for, within six feet for 15 minutes or more. We obtain all those close contacts. We inform them about what the difference is between isolation and quarantine. So when somebody is positive, we isolate them, which means that we designate an area that they can, would be like a sick area. So if they're in a household, um, we try to identify a safe place that they can isolate all by themselves, a bedroom. Um, we also ask like, what does their house look like? Do they have a bathroom or that only can be designated to them? Um, and that there is some shared spaces really looking at how can they do the cleaning and disinfecting to try to reduce that spread within the household. We also put, um, so when you're on isolation, you can't go anywhere, you can't really be around anybody during that time frame, And that is usually um, 10 days from your onset of symptoms or your test date, whichever comes first. They also have to meet a criteria of being symptom um, clinical improvement. So we wanna see that symptoms have improved and they also have to be fever free for at least three days with, without having any fever reducing medication in them. Once they're able to have all of those criteria, we then release them from isolation, which means they can go back to work, um, go back into the community, get their groceries, um, and start living a, as normal life as they can. Um, however, their family that they were around or their close contacts, they are quarantined, which means that they are required to stay six feet um, away from all others um, and practice that um, high, good high hygiene um, and trying to reduce that um, contact with individuals. Some of these people that are in quarantine, if they are asymptomatic, most of them are staying home. The other ones we would, if they're essential workers, so meaning if they work in a healthcare setting, um, EMS, um, corrections, you know, those operations are essential. We need them to keep going to take care of our, our communities. And so if they're asymptomatic, we do allow them to go back to work, but it is basically quarantined only with work release. So basically they can go to work, but once they come home, they need to obey those guidelines of quarantine. So they're not in the community um, doing whatever they want um, is what our recommendations would be. When they do that, they're going into a workplace that is taking full responsibility with doing symptom checks, monitoring temperatures, um, and reporting if somebody does end up showing symptoms and going and getting tested to the Department of Health. So we have very close partnerships with all of those businesses um, in working very close with them on a daily basis with these um, work employees that can return to work. Um, if there is a social contact, um, People that are outside of the essential care, they are moved on to what's called contact tracing. So another group of state employees um, call these individuals um, to let them know the guidelines as well. So we do kind of, with a pandemic, um, we want definitely good quality, but we also need to look at quantity and trying to get information out to the public, out to contacts as quickly as we can so we can try to contain this illness. And um, South Dakota is doing a very, very good job. Um, and you know, the data is showing that you know, everybody is really taking this serious um, and taking precautions. Um, any questions so far? Well, looks like we had a couple pop in. Um, <clears throat> I think that was Keith that asked that. Keith, are you still on or did you have to go on a call? Uh, he might have had to go. Um, 
So Keith asked if we could talk about non-transport of the COVID-19 patient uh, targeting cardiac arrest that did not. Targeting cardiac arrest that did not survive and was not transported to the hospital the entire plot process. Um, Keith, can you just kind of explain maybe what you're after there for a question? Hey, Greta, question for you. Just a second, please. I'm going to mute for a second. Uh, while we're waiting for Keith to get back on, we'll take one here from Diane from down in Stratford. Um, I'm trying to operate a computer I'm not too familiar with, so to bear with me. Uh, what is the what has been the success of isolation within a house, Greta? What do you have there? Yeah, so that can be very tricky, as you know, um, going into individuals' house on those recommendations. So we work very closely to see if that even is a possibility. Can they isolate in their own room? Can the rest of their household kind of separate and not be within six feet? Um, if we identify a home where there is no option to get them in their own room to be isolated, there are services that, um, that are available in the state um, that we can help find them in a, a safe place to go so they can meet that isolation or quarantine that we are recommending. Um, but they have to be having to be willing to move, you know, out of that that environment as well, and that is a challenge. Um, the other challenge is we're working with mothers that just had babies, you know, um, and keeping them away from their brand new baby is hard. Um, so there, there definitely is some challenges there, um, and it's just a lot of education that we do have to um, give them on the risk if they don't, you know, um, comp comply with that isolation recommendation. But I would say that a majority of our population um, take that recommendation from us um, and they have an isolating and we check in with them. Their household members, we're checking in daily. So we, we do a text or we call them every single day to um, just check in to see if anybody else has developed symptoms, um, how they're doing. Um, and if there's any barriers. So can they make it 14 days without any, you know, not going to the grocery store? Um, do they need some medical supplies? So we are able to assist with some of that um, or get an agency that we have partnership with in the communities to meet those needs of those individuals if they need something. All right, Keith, do you want to kind of explain that, what you were asking there, if you're still on? Yes, sir. Greta, question for you. I've been advising our area of first responders that the Department of Health will follow up with any COVID-19 patient exposures from the transport ambulance services. Uh, a case came up where Every Fire and Rescue worked cardiac arrest for a COVID-19 positive patient, and that patient was not transported by us. Subsequently, was transported to, um, to the coroner, and they did their thing. About seven days later, we still had not received a phone call or a follow-up from the Department of Health advising or just talking and seeing what's going on. Um, I was advised that you guys don't do that unless a hospital, excuse me, unless a patient is transported to a hospital. Otherwise, you have to wait till um, vital statistics get a hold of you. Can you speak to what I just talked about so we're all on the same page? Yeah. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't know the specific incident you're probably talking about. Um, I'm going to tell you straight up, like, if you ever run into um, where you feel that there, you know there, there was a positive COVID case that you transported and you don't get that call from the Department of Health, please feel free to give us a call. 
Um, we don't want these things to fall through the cracks um, and we will work with you um, through that process. Um, now, if we don't have a reportable condition, that's what makes this hard um, because we don't work on a suspect case unless a clinical diagnosis is there or we have a positive lab. So, um, but to answer your question, Han, if somebody tested positive and they're not transported to the hospital and they're transported somewhere else, you are still considered a close contact. And so we, the Department of Health would be in contact or should be in contact with your facility to identify um, who would have been on that route. So Did that, that answer your question, Keith? Yes and no. Um, <laughs> this patient was identified as sick on a Saturday, was tested on a Monday, was notified by the Department of Health on a Wednesday that it was positive, and then subsequently um, died on a Friday in which Aberdeen Fire and Rescue crews, Aberdeen Police Department, investigators, Aberdeen Ambulance Service, and coroner all had contact with this patient, but there was no follow-up done until after I contacted the Department of Health several days later, and that's when they discussed that they don't do anything until vital statistics tells them. So my more important question then is, does the Department of Health do, does do, does or do follow-ups with COVID-19 positive patients on a regular basis? For an example, every two days you check in to see how things are going and until the 10 days is up. Yeah, so if we had a COVID positive patient and we had that reportable lab, we would be following up. How often do you follow up with the patient once the patient's been notified that they're positive? So we would do an initial investigation. Um, so we would basically talk to them about the result once we receive that result. Um, and that's when we obtain all these close contact lists um, and information on where they were. We, I mean, investigators are supposed to, you know, talk, especially if they know they're going to the hospital, who transported you there? You know, was it, did you drive yourself or was it an ambulance? That's a, a critical question to ask. So um, that might be more education that needs to be done on this side as well. Um, then what we do is we follow up with them at that 10 day criteria. So 10 days after their onset or their test if they did not have symptoms. So we have individuals that are asymptomatic. So we really don't have an onset to go off of. So that is when we go off of their test date. So we would follow up 10 days after that and we would discuss about um, are they able to be released from isolation? and to meet that criteria. Thank you. I think um, based on the information that you gave me and my interpretations of it, that I will be contacting the Department of Health probably within the next day to several days so that we can maybe work out a procedure yeah. for something. Okay, that sounds great. And I will, yeah, and if you want to call me offline, I'd be happy to visit with you and I could get you connected to the appropriate person to maybe work through some of this system. Outstanding. That you have. Greta, do you want to tell me your number or Absolutely, give it to yeah. Kyle and have him text it to me? Yeah, I can just shoot it over to you, Keith. I'll just shoot it over okay. to you after this. That'll work Thank perfect. you so much, Keith. Yeah, thank you, Keith. You bet. All right, we got any other questions from the group? I have a couple of them, I guess. Retta, when you guys are dealing with um, the folks that you're talking to, how difficult is the language barrier that you guys deal with? 
Yeah, so um, we have several languages in um, South Dakota, and we have we are lucky enough to be able to have language um, interpreting services. So we have not yet been able to not be able to communicate with an individual with the interpreting services that we offer here at the state of South Dakota. Good, good deal. Anybody else have anything? I do want to say something about this Department of Health since I have started working for the state about three and a half weeks ago, I'm, I'm actually in this office building and this team is just blowing me away with the work that they're putting in. They are working seven days a week, 12, 15, who knows how many hours a day. So if you see these people run into these people, thank them for everything that they're doing because um, it, it's, it's amazing to watch it on a daily basis and it just continues on. There's just, there seems like there's no end for these people. So if you see them, thank them because they're doing a fantastic job uh, to get ahead of this. So any other questions before we, before we move on to Keith? Well, thank you very much, Greta, for taking time out of your crazy busy week yeah, to, to visit with her. And I appreciate all your kind words. And, um, you know, it's a lot of work, but we are happy to do it to serve South Dakota. Uh, we know that it's a lot of work and it's different work than we've ever seen before. Um, so we're going to have hiccups along the way, um, but we are happy to partner with you um, and work through anything that we can to make it easier on your side as well. So thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Keith, you're up. We'll catch you before you got to run on a call. Yeah, we got trees falling in the houses and it's just it's, getting crazy out there. <clears throat> from where I'm sitting, it moved through here in about five minutes. <laughs> okay. So here's the information I have for you guys. What's going on? First off, in Brown County, things are starting to level off a little bit. Uh, I'm warm and fuzzy with the leveling off as far as that is concerned. We are hanging for the past four days, excuse me, five days. We've been hanging between 62, 62, 64, 63, and 63 um, active cases. To me, that's good. It means the public, the Department of Health, the first responders, everybody is doing what they're supposed to do. If you guys remember when we first started um, tracking and doing all this and we were getting information from everybody that this week we were supposed to be peaking in and around the 300 potential cases in a hospital. So I'm warm and fuzzy with this. Our recovered numbers are also going up. I like that. That makes me feel warm and fuzzy. Um, some things to think about. Well, let me get my glasses on. I apologize. Edmonds County is at three. Day County is at two. And Marshall County is at one. Um, so the other counties are, are in Dickey County. North Dakota is at one. I apologize. This means that we're still short as far as numbers are concerned. And I'm warm and fuzzy with that. I did have a question asked of me earlier today about HVAC system, heating, air conditioning, ventilation systems, and houses. Um, what I have for you as far as that is concerned is that one, most generally, you don't have to panic about HVAC systems. Yeah. Okay, guys, I'm going to have to take off. We're doing a search on a house where a tree collapsed into it. I apologize. That's all right, Keith. I'll, I'll pick it up. Um, actually, I should ask first, was there anybody else that came on to speak tonight? I know we had a couple of people that were thinking about it, but was there anybody else that's on that's going to be speaking tonight? I, I hate to ask like that because it makes me sound like I don't know what I'm doing, but I know we had a couple of feelers out there. I'm going to take that as a no. So I see Albert, were you going to do, were you going to speak tonight at all? Is, is Dr. Owens with you? Uh, 
Yeah, this is Dr. Owens. No, um, Albert's out working in Rapid City. Oh, I just saw that he popped up on here. So he might be listening. Tell him you're on with your wife. I'm on with I'm on with Wendy. Yep, yep. Did but you I'll have anything to listening in? But yeah, but yep. Did you have anything tonight, Dr. Owens? No, except back okay. to the basics: PPE, PPE, PPE. Model it to the people in your communities. That that's the only, that's the only way we're going to stop this thing. All righty, thank you. So to kind of pick up where Keith left off, I'm going to try to wing this thing. Um, is you know obviously just stay afloat or stay stay abreast with what CDC is putting out there, what the Department of Health is putting out there. Honestly, as EMS providers and EMS professionals, the Department of Health and the CDC website should be a daily look. You guys should go to those things daily. Check out what's going on. Um, you know, read up on what's going on in your county and your neighboring counties. Um, also, you continue to keep in mind um, the keeping track of your local EMS or your neighboring EMS groups. Um, there has been a couple of little ticks up in some of the counties that, that didn't have any before. Uh, you look at like Edmonds, Keith talked about that. They've got three active cases right now um, where they, they rolled away for a long time without having anything. So, you know, we don't necessarily know who is involved in that. So make sure that if you have a mutual aid agreement with those, those EMS services in those counties, that you are checking in with them, making sure that they're not gonna be running short of EMTs and, and then also, you know, potentially having to help out uh, with that. So, you know, that's one of the things to think about. Um, also, um, just keep track of those numbers, keep track of what's going on um, and just, you know, stay, stay abreast of the situation. Um, I see Patty Woods is on. Patty, do you have anything, any updates from the county side of things? I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but I'm I'm reeling a little bit here with without having stuff in front of me and Keith having to leave. So, um, Patty, do you have anything that, to update us from what the county, what's going on in the county side of things? Um, yeah, as far as we're we're concerned, we're kind of still at a standstill. Um, Northern the. Um, Northern's facility where we were allowing people to stay if they needed to stay, that's going to be closing down here because it wasn't used enough and Northern is now gonna have to get back into cleaning and everything for their you know, upcoming school year. So that will be closing if anybody was in the, in you know, using that. Um, other than that, I think, um, you know, we're just doing the same thing, trying to make sure people have the PPE, um, hand sanitizer, um, we're trying to help Northern so they have enough hand sanitizer. And so they're trying to work with that. Um, other than that, I think, you know, we're just kind of at a, just filling in where we need to other than, you know, we're ready for everything else if it happens, but we're, uh, we're kind of just, kind of just floating along right now. All right. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Uh -huh. um, so then the next question to the group that we have on tonight, we have about 35 people on tonight, is kind of let me know what you guys want to do as far as continuing to have these. Um, you know, we've been going 10 weeks now. We've done nine, nine meetings since we took last week off due to the holiday. Uh, but kind of let me know what you guys want as far as who you want to hear from, um, if you want to continue having them every two weeks, if you want to go monthly, how you want to, how you want to handle that. So send me an email uh, or drop it in the chat box. Just kind of let us know what, what your, what your thoughts are. Um, obviously we want, we want to continue to get, get you guys good information and get you guys good, good, um, good direction to go, but we also don't want to be obviously you know, waste your time either if it's if it's not something that you're gonna you feel is useful. So, just let us know kind of what you're thinking, what you'd like like us to keep doing. And I think with that, I'm probably going to um, kind of gonna call it a night with, with losing Keith was one of our speakers tonight. But um, you know, it is what it is. We all we all adapt when when we get a call. So, um, Sandy or Michaela, do you guys have anything tonight? This Sandy, I don't. Okay. Michaela, anything? Nope, none for me. 
All right, so before you guys all take off on here, um, we will we will have our planning meeting um, next week sometime probably to figure out what we're gonna do in two weeks um, or if that's, if that's the route that we're gonna continue on with. Um, so stay tuned for, uh, for, for an email and the Zoom link for that, for that uh, webinar. So with that, I don't really have anything else unless anybody else does. Everybody good? It was kind of a short one tonight, but it is what it is. So hope everybody has a good night, stays safe, enjoys the hot weather that we're gonna be having. Um, have a good night. Thanks, Kyle. You Thanks, bet. Kyle. Yep, you bet.